HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to enjoy inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to for uh small business owners, sales professionals, and entrepreneurs. And that is because of the guests who join me to have a conversation. They bring their expertise. I bring the conversation. And together, we provide you with the information that you need to do better things in your business. Today, my guest is David Avrin. David has become one of the most popular speakers on customer experience in the world today. In recent years, David has presented for enthusiastic organizations and audiences in 22 countries on six continents. A former CEO group leader and an in-demand speaker for Vistage International, the world's leading CEO member organization, David has had over 4,000 one-on-one conversations with company leaders regarding their value proposition and competitive advantages. David is the author of Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back. Thanks so much for joining me today, David. Hey, I am thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. I am thrilled to have you here. Um, Customer experience is one of my favorite topics, probably because uh, (laughs) so often uh, the experience is not as great as I would like it to be. You think? Um, You think? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And and I know, uh, you know, everyone gets frustrated with bad service. I get it. Okay. But is it is service getting worse, or are we just more aware of it? 
Well, I, well uh, the answer is, is yes and yes, but for very different reasons. I think, I think we're very aware of it because we just share everything, right? Um, yeah. and, and, you know, we, there was an old adage, and we all grew up in business with what we used to call basic guest relations philosophy. And that said, the average person with a positive experience will tell two or three people, right? But the person with a negative experience is going to tell 10. And yeah. I tell audiences across America and around the world, I say, none of that is true anymore. Now we tell thousands. Now we tell millions. We're not telling 10 people. I mean, just drag a paying customer off your airplane. See how fast that spreads, <laughs> right? I mean, we have Good mechanisms point. today, but along with that has come a change in our mindset that we feel it's not only our, our right um, to share, you know, bad experiences, but our responsibility. I mean, my God, people take pictures of their food and put, I mean, it's like, stop doing that, by the way. If you're listening right now, stop yeah. taking pictures of your food and sending it out. But, um, but yeah, so I think we're, we're much more aware and we have more vehicles to share that information and to spread that information. And yesteryear, a bad move could survive for a week or two. It can't survive for two days today because yeah. we have this mechanism. So to answer your other question, which is, is it getting worse? And the answer is, it is getting worse, but for, but for, not, um, for, for a very different reason. And understand when I'm talking about customer experience, I'm not talking about customer service. They're related, they're branches on the same tree, but they are really different. I mean, customer service, I think we get that. Treat people with respect, service with a smile. Um, it's not always sustainable at every interaction or transaction. We've got young people on the front line. But, but customer experience is different. It's how do we, as consumers, whether it's B2B or B2C, how do we experience doing business with you as a business owner at every point of contact? I mean, is it, is it easy? Was it arduous? Was it frustrating? Uh, do you have an incredible product or service, but you go to your website and I can't reach a freaking person. I can't talk to a real person. Well, there's a reason for that because you as a business owner decided you were not going to put your phone number because you wanted everybody to fill out your contact form because look, we're going to direct them all this way and look how great it's going to work. And then they'll, they'll give us extra information and we'll be able to, to pre-qualify them and tailor our solutions. Well, here's the problem. We don't want to fill out your contact form. Yeah. The, contact, the contact form is the answering machine of the internet and we, we don't want any part of it. So the reason it's getting worse is because there's a disconnect between how businesses want to do business and how we want to do business with them. They're sort of adopting what we, what we sort of call the, the, uh, the franchise model, right? If we can have a, a, a standard operating procedures, here's how we do what we do at every point of contact. Here's where, how we greet our customers. Here's where this happens. And then we put them through this flow. And sometimes it makes sense. You go to Chipotle, you order here, you customize it here, and then you pay for it on your way out. But the reason it's getting worse is that businesses are trying so hard to standardize how the process flow and their customer's journey through the company is that sometimes they forget to ask us how we want to buy from them. And so we get frustrated because we don't want to do business the way they want to do business. And so in our mind, it is getting worse because they're, they're disconnected from how we want to buy. That's so interesting. I'm listening to you and I'm thinking they're so concerned with making sure that they have a system that works for them right. that they're in their own head, right? They're thinking about themselves instead of what is my customer going to really want and experience in a way that is going to get them to come back. Yeah. What we do an exercise, we talk about, it's called DLOC, D-L-O-C, day in the life of the customer. Do you really understand them and what they're looking for? Because the reality is most of these businesses, they're really good at what they do. Yeah. They're great at their products and services and nobody is trying to, pardon my language, they're not, they're not trying to piss off their customers, but they're doing so by being inflexible, by yeah. here's our policy. Because if we have greater predictability, right, in our flow and the customer's behavior and their buying habits, a greater pre predictability in terms of income and revenue, et cetera. But the reality is we don't, necessarily want to be predictable. We aren't demographic. I mean, every 22 year old Asian woman isn't going to buy clothing the same way as others, but that's why people buy franchises, right? They buy them because yeah. there's a greater likelihood of success if you follow our processes. But what it doesn't allow for is a, is a measure of humanity. And this is part of my mantra as I speak across the country around the world. 
is we've lost the humanity. And I don't say that because we should be better people. We should, but because it's really smart business. And when your people uh, are, are really good, and when I say and all, of, all of your, your many listeners, is um, are we teaching policy quoting or are we teaching decision making? Because right. we, we go through this process, Diane, I think you'll understand this and, and you'll agree. When companies hire workers, they go through a pretty exhaustive process and they're working with Monster or Indeed or somebody else and we screen them, we look at their background and we look at the decisions and are there employment gaps and we interview them and we ask them questions and we wanna check their judgment. And then, so tell me about a situation that you've, you had to overcome and what did you do it and why? And then when we finally hire them, we immediately neuter them. Now just follow the procedures. Like we love that they could make great decisions. They had this great experience. Now just do things our way. And yeah. what we've, we've done is taken away their ability to do the right thing. And, and I'll give you examples. So there, one of my chapters in my new book, Why Customers Leave, is, is just how often we say no. And sometimes we say no without thinking. And maybe it's no, sorry, you can't bring your drink in the store. It's like, I'm a 55-year-old man. I'm not going to spill on your clothes with the gap. You know, or I just, I just, I just bought a seven dollars Starbucks and and sixteen right. euros. You're not gonna let me bring that in. Well, guess what? I'm not leaving it outside, so now I'm not going to come into your store at all. It's just right. kind of very dumb flexibility. Young woman with her friends at lunch, and she orders a chicken Caesar, and she says, "Can I, can I substitute shrimp for chicken? I see the shrimp on the menu. Oh no, we don't do substitutions. Well, why? They don't do it because their cook doesn't want to do it. I don't care what their cook right. wants to do. I mean, what's the alternative? Not giving her what she wants." And then she doesn't come back and goes online and rants about what a, what a crappy restaurant you were. But the argument I get, and I work with organizations around the world. I was just in Abu Dhabi and I worked for an entire day with a big multi-billion dollar company and they've got like Capri Sun and yogurts and all the other. And what we get all the time, no matter where I am in the world, is we'll get the slippery slope argument. Well, if we do it for them, we have to do it for everybody. And I'm like, no, you don't. You just have to do it for the people who ask. If you right. can if you can't, because most people will never ask for an accommodation, but you're so quick to say no. It's like, why not? Just charge them a few extra bucks. That we want to know that we're that our unique circumstances, that our experiences, we get to decide who we're doing business with, that that you treat us like human beings. Sometimes our situation, our question, um, doesn't fit within your training. So what are you going to do? Well, the easy answer for too many, as you had originally talked about sort of service getting worse, the easy answer is no. Sorry, we don't do that. Right. You know, I was checking but out. Boy, of a, does that happen oh, all yeah. the time. Too much. Because it's oh. easy. Diane, it's just easy. Yeah. And for your listeners, I mean, whether you're small business, medium size, wherever you're working in, in, in terms of that chain, we're, we're competing. I mean, we're trying to, to feed our families every day. Can we afford to have somebody less than satisfied. It doesn't mean that no. we're gonna accommodate everything that's unreasonable, but most of what you get actually is reasonable. I'll give you a quick example. I was, uh, it was seven o'clock in the morning, I'm leaving a hotel, and I'm speaking to a CEO group from like eight till noon. And I walked by the front desk, I said, I'm, uh, I'm in room 216, I'm a Diamond member, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I need to have a late checkout. And she goes, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, we're, we, we're not doing any late checkouts today. And I said, oh, um, I'm like walking out the door right now, I'm not packed up, uh, I don't even get off stage until 12, but I'm really close, I'll be back by 12.15, I'll be out by 12.30. She goes, oh yeah, sorry, we have a convention coming in, a conference, and we're just not doing any late checkouts. And I said, I, 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 I won't be able to get out. Listen, if you can't be out by noon, I'm going to have to charge you for a second day. True story. Ah. And so I calmly, because I teach this, and I, look at her and I said, okay. I said, so here's the deal. If you're going to charge me for a second day, I'm just not going to check out at all. I and mean, if I'm going to pay for it, I'm going to keep the room. So now yeah. you don't have a room at all for that convention uh, goer that coming in. Is that the outcome you were looking for? And she's like, um, let me talk to a manager. Hang on, right? She comes back 10 seconds later. One o'clock would be fine. Of course it would. Of course it would. Right. right. But the reality is she wanted to say yes. She wasn't allowed to. Yeah. So how inflexible are we? And sometimes they're dumb policies. I mean, there, there's one policy I think borders on cruel. It's probably the most short-sighted. It's the signs we see everywhere that say restrooms are for paying customers only. Yeah. And I'm like, really? I'm like, somebody's got to go to the bathroom. Oh, no, those are for our customers. And, and I ask audiences, and it's actually a funny moment. I, my, my stuff is really funny and entertaining, but I use it to temper a pretty tough message about what it yeah. takes to compete. But I'll ask them, I say, is how many people in this audience have ever bought something they would never have bought 
for so they could use a bathroom, <laughs> like a chapstick <laughs> or, a, or a zag nut or a, a cup of coffee or something. And like yeah. three quarters of the room raised their hand. I'm like, well, guess what, Spooky? You just made a buck 23 and I'm never coming back to this place again. It's, you know, we don't want to take it. They're not taking advantage of you. They have to go to the bathroom. Be a human being. I think we are getting worse, but I don't think it's at the customer service. I think we're just so caught up in our own policies and how we want to do business that we're losing the, the flexibility and the humanity and the individuality that people want. Oh, I totally agree with you. And, and it, it's so, um, like I'm thinking of so many experiences where you, you think to yourself, okay, that's an arbitrary line that you're drawing in the sand. And you know, one of the things that I talk about when, when I do speaking is people don't like arbitrary. Children don't like it. Adults don't like it. Right. If there's a really solid reason for something, people will understand it. People are reasonable. But when you just hold fast to a line that no one can figure out why you're holding fast to, you do more damage yeah. than you would if you just went ahead and... Because that's our policy. Event. But the kids, as you had mentioned, Diane, the kids are, they'll call it out, won't they? Yeah. But why? And, and then we, and we, the line that we all said we would never say, because <laughs> I said so, right? <laughs> And they were turning into yeah, our parents. The worst reason, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, really? Okay, yeah. When we grow up, you can be mean too. But right now, you're going to do yeah. what I say. But yeah. why? Right. As adults, yeah. we think it, we just don't say it. You know, here, here's what I have found to answer that, that point specifically. Yeah. Oftentimes, most policies were put in place for a reason. And not to be mean, oftentimes they were a response to a previous situation that we decided to make a blanket let's punish there's a whole uh, part of my uh, thing don't punish everyone for the actions of a few that's why yeah. we have to walk out of costco and sam's club show our receipt to the very nice person who draws a smiley face on that receipt but the reality is it doesn't cover up the fact they're checking to make sure we're not stealing things absolutely like, really it doesn't feel good i mean i don't yeah. want to give you don't want to give the, the hard time to the retiree who draws the smiley face but Come on, really? I went. I walked into a, a TJ Maxx in Kansas sometime after a gig, and I was just walking around. I was going to try on some stuff. I had a couple hours to kill, and I went back to the the dressing room, and and they would. Um, I couldn't bring everything in. You can only maximize yeah. three <laughs> items, and I'm like, but I but I have five items to try on. So well, you can't. I said, well, what do I do? They said, well, try those on, get dressed, come back out, we'll give you the other two. And, oh, and you can't try on your shoes at all in there. I'm like. I mean, they were, you look at the signs around, they were more concerned over what somebody might steal than what they might buy. And yeah. so that's playing not to lose. And so the question, when was the last time somebody in that store stepped back? And yeah, they may have a, 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 a shoplifting problem. I have great respect for doing reasonable things. But when was the last time they sat back and said, what is this doing to the vast majority of people who would not steal from us? And are we losing our, our, uh, attractiveness to right. those as well. I, I was working with, I'll give you a quick story that, that, that'll make you smile. Um, there, I was working with a, a gymnastics and cheer and dance academy. It's a big multi-million dollar facility. They'd, they'd opened a year before, big fanfare, uh, full class. The guy calls me a year later and says, we're struggling with retention. I said, really? Why? I mean, what a beautiful facility. He says, yeah, they're signing up for the class, but they're not coming back. And I'm like, why? He said, I don't know. Would you come in? Would you audit some classes? Maybe talk to some parents. Long story short, I showed up. It was in town where I am, just south of Denver. And I drove up Tuesday afternoon, walked in the door, and within 10 seconds, I knew what the problem was. Because there were signs everywhere scolding the parents for something. If you're late, we're going to charge you $10, $10 for every 15 minutes and blah, blah. I'm like, these are your customers. I'm like, why would you put that up? And they say, oh, sometimes the, the parents are late. I'm like, okay. Sometimes parents are like, why do you care? They're not in the rain. The kids are in the lobby. They're watching TV. Yeah. They're playing on their phones. He said, well, it's a matter of respect. I said, yeah. Why are you disrespecting your parents? You know, I mean, the, the policy was <laughs> response. There was a sign. There was a sign that said no popcorn in the eating area. And I said, the parents can't have popcorn. They said, oh, just not in the, in the viewing area. That's what the viewing area. And I, I said, well, I, yeah, in the viewing area. I said, well, that's where they want to be. They want to watch their kids. And he says, yeah, but it makes a big mess. I said, okay. He says, oh, no, 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 the staff has to clean it up. I went, okay. And he's like, uh, I said, let's be clear. You have a popcorn machine 
and you're telling people they can't eat popcorn that you just gave them? Well, not in the viewing. I'm like, oh my God. It's like, but, but it was response to somebody who said, look at this big mess I want to clean up. Well, let's just not let them do it. Right. Our, and this is, a, this is an important lesson for your listeners. Your policies are not in place to make life easier for your staff. Oh. They're in place to make things wonderful for your clients. And I think your, your, yeah. team, your team will understand if they have to do some things that might be a little bit of a pain in the backside. But if your clients love it, it's like that flexibility. If she wants right. shrimp on her, give her shrimp. Charge her a few extra bucks. You know what she would love? That. She would, she's telling you exactly what she wants. Give it to her. Come back and she'll tell her friends. But we fall back on policy. And that provides um, a, a poor customer experience. Because most, really most, most unhappy consumers don't complain. They just don't come right. back. They just don't right. come back. Right. That's exactly. And if you're hard to do take business. take a quick sponsor break. And then I, I, I want to hear more of this. So, Outstanding. Hey, All right. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back by our guest, David Averin. Right and answer. <laughs> and Leading Loyalty by Lena Renee. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. As I mentioned, we are speaking with David Averin about Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back. And I'll give you another so, plug, audible.com, right. sign up for that trial. All of my, <laughs> all of my books are on audible. Let's do an extended one. Let's make audible really happy. We're going to do an extended commercial for audible.com. There's no better way to listen to a book than the author themselves. You hear the inflection, you hear their urgency. It's the way they want it to be heard. And the other cool thing is my books on audible.com on all Alexa enabled devices. You'll actually hear it. Just say play. Why Customers Leave by David Aaron, and they'll play through your Alexa. It's awesome. That sign is up, just Sign crazy. up for your free trial today. How is that? Exactly. That was fabulous. Thank you. And I have that recorded, so now I can use it. Play that, play that for <laughs> yes. them as well. Yeah. I, was, I know. I know. I know. It'd be so great. Well, and I'm with you a million percent. It, it is really the absolute best way. That's the reason why they are our sponsor. So, customer experience. So you 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 know you travel around the world, you see this other places. So this is not uniquely an American problem, right? Is it no, different here than it is in other countries? We we see it everywhere, but it's not only an American problem, but it's 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 a or not just an American problem. It is a wonderful worldwide opportunity. So mm. my presentations, it's not negative. I'm not just hammering everybody on the on the head of saying stop doing this and stop pissing off your customers, but they're wonderful opportunities to stand out and stand apart by envisioning and crafting and delivering a superior customer experience. A lot of people, a lot of the sort of the traditional customer service people and some brilliant people within the space have sort of morphed over to customer experience. And some of them have oversimplified in thinking that, you know, branding is to marketing what customer experience is to customer service. It's just the natural evolution. And I don't know that it is. Um, I think it really is much more. It's an opportunity for organizations to examine every point along their customer's journey and pull out a magnifying glass and ask the question, could that be done? Or is that the way it should be done? And in most cases, the answer is yes, because you're good at what you do. But could that be done better or faster or more personalized or, or expedited or less personalized if, if that is attractive? Can you do that without a real person? Uh, can somebody find a real person when they do? When somebody reaches you online, can they find what they want immediately? Can they do it with one click? Can they sign in with their face? Uh, it's becoming very granular as, as businesses recognize yeah. any point of contact. Because I, I saw somebody had asked a question, if you could advise companies, what if they could do just one thing, what would be the one most important thing? I said, if you can only do one thing, then just prepare for your going out of business sale because it's <laughs> not one thing. There is no one answer. 
because we knew growing up, and this has sort of been historically um, accurate, you could go to an amazing restaurant, and if their bathroom is disgusting, it taints your entire yeah. vision and remembrance of that experience, right? Yeah. Well, now, we've got multi-billion dollar companies that they tell us how valuable we are, and they put us on hold uh -huh. for 45 minutes. You know, your call well, is not important. only that. Come well, on. not only that, but the way you get the customer loyalty department is by complaining about something. Right. 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 If you Instead want certain customer want... loyalty department reaching out to you and saying, "Thank you so much for being a long time I, customer." I know. I know. Well, here's <laughs> it even goes to a different place, Diane. Do you realize if you ask for customer service in most companies, it's the complaint department. It's not the yeah. customers. It's the com like I say to, to organizations all the time. I say, "Listen, if you have you have so many unhappy customers, that you need to create an entire department to deal with them. Can we not reallocate some of those dollars to not make them angry in the first place? Seriously. Can, can we can we really track those points of frustration and say, can we can that be done differently? Can it be done better? Is that the way it has to be done? And that's where a lot of disruption comes from. And and the term is thrown out a lot. You know, I, I guarantee yeah. The, yeah. the taxi drivers in the world didn't anticipate, oh, by the way, every car around is now a taxi yeah. and uh, I mean that's disruption but I joke that if it's happening to you it's disruption but if you're the one eating it it's innovation right it's the same thing yeah, right. But, right. but for everybody listening right everybody in business there are other people sitting in rooms right now trying to figure ways to do what you do differently and more expedited or more facilitated or more friendly or more um, memorable or 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 crazy or whatever. But you have to realize that there's always people trying to do what you're doing better. Now, the question is, are you going to just frantically try to respond to it? Or can maybe we envision a different way of doing things? Can you take a half day off with your team and go off site and do a treat, whether it's facilitated by somebody like me or, or do it in-house and ask some hard questions and have fun with it and order in food and put big Butcher, butcher paper on the wall and have people write ideas and, and this point of contact. Give me different ways of doing it that, that whether or not the technology even exists or whether we could afford it. And that's where innovation comes from. Um, it's something that's uncomfortable and we're trying to make it better. But there's too no many people but... who say this is how we do it. This is just the way it's done. Well, really? Does it have to be? I, I, absolutely. I completely agree with you. And, and it seems to me, so I'm curious about this, that if, the, if a company would really look at where are those places where uh, we are getting complaints, people are expressing dissatisfaction? I, it seems to me that, th it, that it would be in the same places. So it wouldn't be like one person's over here, another person's over there, so we have to change things wholesale. Right. It seems you would see to me trends. That, you would see trends. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. But here's, here's the problem. And, and it's not that companies are tone deaf. They're really, really trying. There's parts where they're not getting it. Like what they'll say to me why is, not? Oh, well, here's why they're not, because they're, they're evaluating it incorrectly. And okay. I get company leaders who come to me and they, they bring me in and we have sort of an assessment, sort of how are you doing in different places? And they'll say, no, 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 no. Because I say, you've got to step outside of your business, get an outside perspective. And they said, no, we have secret shoppers or we have um, personal investigators, whatever they want to call them, that go through their customer's journey and they rate it and they gauge it and they look at the behaviors. But the problem is what they do, Diane, is they, they gauge it against the policy manual. Like here's our, here's our policy, are the people following the policy? The problem is your customers don't know your policy manual. They're not gauging your effectiveness based on your standard, they're basing it based on whether they felt valued or their time yeah. valued or did they get what they want? Or was it a pain in the backside? They are looking at themselves, but they're doing it against the standard. And we don't know what your standard is. We just know what we like or if we feel frustrated. If we feel frustrated, we leave. And for one major yeah. reason, you know why customers, somebody, I was doing a radio interview, like an actual radio interview, and somebody says, if you were going to say just one simple answer, why do customers leave? Name of my book, Why Customers Leave and How to Win the Back. Yeah. I said, why do customers leave? I said, they leave because they can. That's it. I mean, there's the most, because we've never had more chance choices, more yeah. options than ever. I say that loyal, it's not that loyalty is dead. 
it's just much harder to earn and keep because it's so easy to leave you unless you're really ingrained into their financial systems and somebody is, you know, but that's not most of us. No. Most people, they go to, I said, do you know why people, I, I talk about this, I said, do you know why people choose your competitors? Because unless, unless you have more than 50% market share, more people choose your competitors than choose you. Right? And I said, do you have to understand yeah, why? Right. Unless you have 50%, most people are choosing somebody else. And the reason they do business with your competitors is because they want to because they like them, because they're really good. And, yeah. and I, I get this even from a competitive standpoint, so often that the companies just, they drink their own Kool-Aid. They think that nobody else gets it. You know what, you know, you know why, they'll, they'll say this, I hear, I talk to CEOs, you know, you know, you know why we're, we're successful? We actually do what we say we're gonna do, as if it's a mic drop, right? And I'm like, <laughs> you really believe, I'm like, you really believe that, don't you? Do you really believe that? How it, how on God's green earth are your competitors staying in business with all of that not doing what they say they're going to do? They all do it. Of course. Stop pretending your stop pretending your competitors <laughs> aren't good. You know, I get I see CEOs get in front of their organizations and they say, "Folks, listen. At the end of the day, it still comes down to quality." And I'm like, "Oh no, no, it doesn't." At the beginning, at the beginning of the day, it's about quality. Quality is the entry fee. You better be good at what you do. Yeah. But at, the end, right. at the end of the day, it's about competitive advantage. Not what do you do well? What do you do better than others? Yeah. And so I think the customer experience, I think really taking a step back and not just evaluating and fixing the problems, which is super important, um, but envisioning, have fun with this. How are people going to want to do business with you a year from now? How are they going to want to do business with you on your app, in person, on the phone? I, I, I do a lot of, I keynote a lot of really big conferences. And so I've been doing this for 20 years. And for the first 15 years of it, invariably at some of the big conferences, they would have a futurist as one of the other speakers, right? They'd talk about the future and they'd say, your children are going to grow up in a world with blank and blank or your grandchildren and right, it's Jetsons. They don't say that anymore. They don't say that anymore. You know what they say now, Diane? They say, by this time next year, X yeah. and Y is going to happen within the next oh. 18 months. And so for business owners, the urgency that I, that I push is your business will be different in 18 months. How people buy from you, how easy they do, um, whether they're buying through an app or Alexa or Google Home, or I mean, my God, look at Look at the dentistry industry. Here's, here's an, an odd segue. Um, <laughs> Smile Direct Club right now. You don't even, I mean, they had Invisalign, right? You didn't have to go to the orthodontist yeah. or you could go to a dentist. Now they have Smile Direct Club. You can literally get a medical procedure without ever seeing a dentist or an orthodontist. They send it to your house. They send aligners. The They've literally bypassed the orthodontist. I travel and I'm a, I'm, I have Kaiser because I'm in Colorado. It's like Colorado and, and Arizona and California but I travel everywhere. So I use Teladoc. So I, how do I experience doing business with a doctor when I'm on the road? I go onto my app. If I have a rash, I take a picture of the rash and I send it, they call me, I have a conversation. They said, yeah, it looks infected. What's the nearest uh, Walgreens? And they call in a prescription. The world is changing. It sure I, is. I encourage businesses, you be the one on the forefront yeah. And envision and, and start doing the different things now. Put together a task force or a working group or, or, or do a strategic acquisition to pull in that innovation so you can be competitive 18 months from now. Okay, wait. So um, that leads me to another question. Sure. Do you think the people on the front lines have a – better idea of what the customers want than the people at the top because they're dealing with them or is, is it's that a great not question it's it's stuff. not a one or the other they okay. app, they have different insights and incredible valuable insights when i do strategic sessions with with organizations i make sure that we've got so many stakeholders in the room and i tell them at the beginning i said listen i believe the answers are in the room you live with this every day. I can facilitate this. I can ask some hard questions. I can challenge you. But there are people on the front lines, whether it's front line in terms of customer facing or front lines in terms of working on the shop floor, uh, that 
absolutely they have insights. Uh, unfortunately, some of the decisions are made by the COO and the bean counter, yeah, right? right? Those are the ones who are saying, let's replace 80% of the staff checkout lines at Walmart with self-checkout, Yeah, right? And they'll tell us, oh, no, 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 our, our customers have told us that they want the choice. Well, it's not a choice when you have one staff checkout line and nine carts deep and 22 self-checkout. That's not a choice. That's social yeah. engineering. That's yeah. trying to get us to do business the way you want because you think it'll save you money. But what they don't know is how many people say, I'm not going back to that store. Well, that's lost revenue. My, my yeah. big mantra uh, is the greatest source of lost revenue for your business is the customer, the client, the prospect that you never knew about. They will cost that costs you more money than a bad supply chain, bad employees, uh, bad margins. Your biggest source of lost revenue is the client you didn't know. They, they drove by and they didn't stop or they came in and they left without being engaged or they called on the phone and they hung up because they didn't want to deal with your, your horror voicemail system or worse yet, they came to your website. You got them to go to your website, but they clicked away without buying anything or leaving their information and you have no idea those people were. You're driving them away in some way. And those companies who think they're saving a fortune by firing all of their, their tellers uh, yeah. uh, or checkout people, they have no idea how much money. They're going to look say, look how much money we didn't have to pay in payroll. But how many people did they drive to their competitors? It's short-sighted. Uh, everybody needs to be in the room when those decisions are being made. Marketing needs to be in the room. People uh, on the front lines need to be in the room just to have influence. Yeah, I, I, so thank you for that. And part of the reason that I asked the question is I think so many companies, those decisions are made behind a closed door in, a, in an office yeah. somewhere that is not tethered to the reality of the experience that's going on on a daily basis. Right. Well, I mean, if you want to look at economics here, there, there's, there's two schools of thought. One is what they call the standard economic model, which says a penny saved is a penny earned. If you cut this expense, you're going to make that much more money, right? But it doesn't work that way, yeah. right? Because we have opinions and we have behaviors. So in a dynamic economic model, it says that, uh, that people's behaviors and attitudes, I mean, you can say if we cut 20% of our checkers, we just look at all that money we saved. No, because in a dynamic model, it says now the lines are now 20% longer and there's people right. who simply will not put up with that. That's not a good customer experience. Now, was anybody rude to them? Of course not. There wasn't right. bad customer service. It was a bad experience for the customer. And so, so many of us, I was going to say of them, but I'll put myself in, in that group. We just, <laughs> we just, we just leave because, yeah. because we can. Right. Right. You know. It's so true. And it's so easy to do. And as you said, that we have alternatives. We have other places we can go and choose. Always. But yeah. and even for those in Business. Our biggest role in life is as a customer. So even for those of us who are business owners, our biggest role is, is customer, right? We're going to the grocery store. Everybody is, right? So most, most people can really sort of look in their own experiences and realize, oh my gosh, they do that. I had one last week and I, and I, when I went ranted online a little too much about it, but um, I tried to log into my Wells, I Wells Fargo for my bank and I have multiple accounts because I have small businesses and my personal and so my kids at college and everything. And I couldn't log into the app. It says, you've been locked out. And I'm like, why? My face hasn't changed. And so I called them up and they said, this was literally last week. And they said, um, multiple unsuccessful login attempts. And so we've locked out. You have to change your password. And I said, oh, that was, that was my assistant. She's out of state. She forgot it. And she tried a couple of times. And, said, well, and I said, it's locked. So just unlock it. There was no problem with it. And they said, well, we can't unlock it. You have to change your password. I said, I don't want to, I don't want to change my password. Right. Said, no, no, no to change your password and I said no I'm not I don't want to change my password just turn it back on and they said no you have to I said oh, I don't have to there's lots right. of other banks that want my business I said I'm not trying to be rude but it there was no incursion I understand that you have to lock it out if you think to protect but now you know that nobody tried to get in right. there was no incursion. there was no so it's all fine so turn it back on they said well we can't you have to do it so I went online and I ranted and I'm like am I and then I was, I was talking to my family. I'm like, am I overreacting? Yes, yes, I am. 
you know, and my wife was like, just change your password. I'm like, no, there's a principle here. Yeah. And so it ended up escalating to the point where I got a call from one of the senior VPs because we, we need to sort of wrap up this story so I don't trash Wells Fargo. Yeah. <laughs> and she says, no, because it's my bank. And she says, all right, I've got to be, I want to be really honest with you. I understand your frustration. I said, I don't need to be placated. She says, no, no, I want you to know nobody thought of it. There is no, it was not coded in the system. Uh, we knew that we had to protect if so, there were unsuccessful attempts we locked it out and you had to change your password and then we could secure it nobody envisioned well, what happens if there was a mistake and nobody did try and get in there is she says i'm so sorry but there literally is no possible way there's nobody else to talk to they didn't put the code in uh, that allowed for that nobody thought about it and we're going to go back and talk about it as a company because i think it's a great idea because at the bank if they put a freeze on a check or you're overseas, right? And they freeze your card yeah. because they don't know. Will you call them, tell them, yes, I am. I'm in right. Antwerp, Belgium. And then they turn it back on. They said, right. she said, honestly, and I was so mad for days and I'm ranting online because, you know, it's good fodder because this is what I talk <laughs> about, right? We look for stories. We always right. joke as speakers, we don't have bad things happen to us. We just get new stories. That's right, right. exactly. And so this figure, this is a good story. But she's so contrite and she's so nice. And she says, you are absolutely right. I honor that. There is no physical way to do it because I never put the code in to allow for it. And what am I supposed to say at that point? I'm like, right. okay, thank you for being honest. And then I went and changed my password um, yeah. because I'm not unreasonable. <laughs> I can be demanding, but I'm not entirely unreasonable. But that's an example of companies getting taking time, getting off site and looking at those points of contact, yeah. customer journey. Well, what happens if this, it's flow charting, right? If they yep. do this, if the answer is yes, then we do this. If it's no, it's this. But there's too much emphasis on policy and predictability. And that has led to a decrease in customer satisfaction because we don't always want to do business your way. I have a whole chapter in my book that says, stop making us do business your way. Sometimes we want to do it. Kids don't want to go to the store and buy tennis shoes. They want to go online and design them. Right. Because they can. And most things right. people just, they dismiss, well, that's a millennial thing. Well, that one is, but most of it isn't. Just treat us like, <laughs> just treat us like human beings. Sometimes we need, and once again, they go back to the thing, well, we do it for you, have to, we have to do it for everybody. No, you don't. Just do it for the people who ask if you can, because they and would sometimes it means will love it. And sometimes it means you have a whole new market. Yes. I mean, so, you know, it's not like you can't do both and... It might be a millennial thing. Guess what? They're the buyers that are coming up. So this is what are they you want. Just count them and say, "Oh no, you, you kids, you don't, you don't know. Right. That'll pass." Yeah, mm -mm. they're just unreasonable. But here, I'll go back to the other thing, Diane, that you said earlier. That I think when you talk about like who who has a better idea, the frontline people. Yeah. And I'll give you a perfect perfect example that the answer is yes. So I travel a lot and I'm at airports all the time. I was at an airport last night. And what do you think the number one request at airport restaurants is? Beer. And it's not, you know, and it's not Wi-Fi. It's electrical outlets. Oh, People yeah. want a table next to an electrical outlet. And yeah. so I see people like one after the other. And I sit, because I, I observe this, because I teach this. So I'm sitting up front and there was a, a Chili's to go or something at one of the, at the one of the, uh, uh, one of the airport restaurants and people one after another, do you have any seats next to uh, power? No, we don't have any, or we only have two in the whole place. And they, and they, I'm watching people leave person after person after person. And I'm thinking 10 minutes of lost business would have paid for an electrician coming in and putting 20 more outlets around the restaurant or power strips or something else. But that information was not getting to management. But all the right. servers, all the hosts and hostesses knew that the biggest request was electrical outlets, but they're not being responsive. That's a reason why customers leave. That's not a customer service issue. Everybody was nice, but you didn't have the amenity. You know, sometimes I, I, it's, it's what you don't offer that drives us away. Is it not away. getting the leadership? Is it, it's not. is it that the frontline people aren't thinking about it or they don't think they're going to be heard? I think they don't think that they care or it's not my job. And that's a cultural thing. If, yeah. you, were, if you were a server at Chili's um, with a transient population, which means the people there probably aren't 
irregulars because they're passing through yeah. the airport. Where's the incentive? Oh, you know what? Here's what I think you should do to make your restaurant better. They just think it's not my job. And right. the, but you know whose job it is? Is management. I just right. spoke for I just spoke the RV and campground association because that's a thing. And you know what the number one request for our parks and campgrounds is? By far the number one amenity request is Wi-Fi. Yeah. And people will call ahead if they don't have Wi-Fi, even though of course we bristle and and you know me and my Jeep and, and my son who love to go camping out in the middle of nowhere, but that's revenue. And it's lost revenue when the calls say we don't have Wi-Fi or we have limited Wi or we have Wi-Fi in the clubhouse. They just leave and they go to somebody else. Why? Because they can. They can. Because yeah. they can. So that's yeah. the part about listening. Um, empower your frontline people. Some smart organizations are creating sort of an ad hoc advisory council. And they've got people at every level of their organization that they've identified and give them some strokes and, and say, we would love you to on our you know and then listen to them right and then listen to them oh, listen that's a to big them thing. Yeah. yeah so it, it's one of those things that you can almost say it's simple but it's not easy because we're very busy yeah running our businesses and 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 fighting competition and disruption and cost control and employees that don't show up i get all of that my contention my assertion is that you can gain a meaningful competitive advantage by envisioning and delivering and crafting a superior experience for your customers and clients. Yeah, I agree. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, I have so enjoyed this and, and I just, just it, unfortunately, I guess I have like experiences flooding through my head that I have had. Uh, but some of the things that I'm taking away from this is customers leave because they can and I think that is so critical. People really need to hear that and embrace it and empower their people to help them innovate and meet the needs, you know, if that's what it takes. But be and the wants, to, right? And the yeah. wants and the preferences yeah. of the people. Right. And sometimes it's not, I mean, in yesteryear, people get mad and they just leave. Not everybody's getting mad. Maybe they just didn't get enough. Sleep. Yeah, sometimes the worst thing is customers that are fine. They're yeah. fine. They don't see a problem. Yeah. They're not going to complain. They're not going to go rave about you. They're just, fine. the problem is, and especially with our long term customers that we stop trying, that we stop wooing and courting uh -huh. because we've had them forever. And there's a lot of companies out there that would love to treat your long time customer yeah. like, their, <laughs> like their first time customer. Exactly. And, then, and they start wooing them and offering them incentives and all these other things. And then they leave you and they're like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 what? What happened? We've been yeah. working together for years. It's like, yeah, but you stopped trying. Right. Stop trying. Right. Because you were so busy courting someone new. Yeah. Or getting lost. Yeah. Are, are there some obvious, you know, uh, connections to our personal relationships? Of course. Yeah. We never stop. I, I brought my wife flowers today. Why? Because I never want her to think that I'm not trying anymore. Yeah. I'm crazy in love and I want her to know that. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's not, it, it, it is not difficult. It's, it feels like it requires like it, attention. It does. Right. Okay. So I was going to say, right. It, it's an intentional thing. It's a mindset. You have to, yeah, some Therapy. of the best customer experience programs, and, and, and companies are getting this more and more, but some of the best, this is a position within their organization. They have a director of, some people call it CX, or call it customer experience, um, or, or some variation of that, but it's a priority within the organization, and they're always asking the question, and it's way more than, um, I mean, like, I, I'll give you this, and I know we're, we're almost done with time, is even the whole idea of, of customer surveys, like people want to survey like crazy, make sure we're doing things okay. And also to make sure there's not a problem so they don't go online and say something negative. But sur over surveying takes a, a happy customer, turn them into a frustrated yeah. customer. Like yeah. somebody, somebody says, I have an experience that was good. It was fine. And they send me a survey and I don't fill it out. And the next day I get another and you still haven't filled it out. Yeah. Which is well, now I'm pissed off. I, I did like you and now I don't because you keep sending me so the stupid survey. This is so funny because I keep getting this email from, an, from one of my vendors that says, this is your last chance 
Really? To tell us what, how you feel. It's like, I don't want to, or I would have done it already. Yeah, I was, I, when I was saying, this relationship is on its last legs, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but they don't oh think my about God. it. They think, look how responsive we're being. And you know what? Yeah. There are algorithms, there are settings on your Infusionsoft or Confusionsoft or whatever program you're using <laughs> that says we will do a maximum of two outreaches. That's reasonable. Yeah. And then right. stop. And then, then stop. stop. Stop because well, the other side of that is if you're going to survey, because I, I think what happens is someone goes around and says, This is the latest and greatest thing, you've got to be doing this, you've got to be in touch with your customers, you've got to know how they feel, and they don't like to take long surveys, so just ask them these two questions. And so they ask the two questions, and when you answer them, there's no follow up to it. So, right. I, I had an experience with a, a major telecommunications company that wasn't great and I got the survey and so I answered you know on a scale of one to ten one being awful ten being fabulous I answered one to both questions no thank you so much for giving us your feedback yeah. it's like if you're asking are you asking right. to ask or are you asking to get better exactly like, anybody curious as to why I hated my experience no apparently right. not no no they don't <laughs> So don't even ask me because that adds injury to insult because you asked me when you didn't really care because you thought that you were doing a good thing and wouldn't I, shouldn't I feel great that you cared enough to ask? Well, I don't because no. you didn't. Now really. if you're doing, not doing anything about it. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Or, or you buy something once, you know, if anybody buys from overstock, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get three pitches a day forever from now on. Yeah. They're going to. That's right. The most, the biggest predictor of future behavior. Oh, they bought from you before, so now let's inundate them. Let's take yeah. the best prospect and and frustrate them. It just, no it, doubt, it's insane. It is insane. Oh my gosh. Well, thank goodness you're out there trying to get them all to be sane again. And speaking of that, and I really do I tremendously appreciate um, this conversation. Will it's you tell fun. The it's listeners? fun for me too. Yeah. I'm glad. I, I can tell it is. I know. It's obvious that you really enjoy this. Give me to, to come, come they out of my shell. And... Yeah, give me to come out of my shell just a bit. Yeah, for those who want to get in touch <laughs> with me, you can go to uh, visibilityinternational.com. Visibility International. My name is David Averin, A-V-R-I-N. And the fun thing is all of, uh, you can learn about my speaking and everything there, but if you go to Amazon, uh, all of my books, uh, are, are there, uh, you might know my, my, my first one was, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. And they're all available on Kindle and audible.com. Register today for your free trial of audible.com. And, uh, and send me, and I'm one of those people, send me a private note and uh, I will always respond. i would be on an airplane or, uh, or in some other foreign country, but I always respond, David at davidaverin.com. Oh, that's fabulous. Thank you. And listeners, you know, I always like to thank you because you're the reason we are here. Uh, and, you know, another great conversation today with some really awesome information. I'm hoping you heard it and took a lot of notes. The great thing is you can listen to it again just to make sure you got everything. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor to get a free trial of audible.com and then get any and all of David Averin's books. Uh, and possibly one of them as a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Hey, podcast listeners. My name is Paul O'Connor, and I'm the host of the Rust Belt Rundown, a show that highlights valuable insights from manufacturing executives and business leaders in Northeast Ohio and beyond. We convene these leaders for candid discussions about business, regional happenings, industry trends, entrepreneurship, and more. With a wide range of guests and topics, there is something for everyone. Listen to Rust Belt Rundown for free on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app.